Hello, you fucks. Welcome to John Solo's Beer Brigade. I'm sick. How are you? <laughs> and, uh, and, and tired. I, yeah, sick. <laughs> tired of playing as a game of life. Uh, Andrew's got a bit of a cold himself here, so that's how we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we were just talking about, uh, so first off, you said that you went to a convention that wasn't GRL and you were a, a, a honored keynote speaker, whatever you want to call it. Yes. So tell us about the experience so compared to GRL. Well, I, I, went, I went to Moonlight and Magnolias in Atlanta. I was the lunch speaker for the Friday lunch. They had me do a couple, a couple uh, workshops. I did a panel. It was I met all kinds of people. It was a lot of fun new people so nice. that's a well like at grl we see a lot of the same people every time uh so this was an opportunity for you to to kind of get out and mingle with some new people uh was it specifically mm romance was it broadly romance? no what was it no this is this is a professional conference okay so most of the people almost all the people there were are writers okay so this is an edu a writer's educational type conference I got you. So it's kind of like, uh, what's that, what's that industry, uh, company that, uh, was around a few years ago and, and got kind of hassled almost out of business. Um, yes, kind of... they used to be the, 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 the Georgia romance writers used to be a chapter of romance writers of America, but they disaffiliated. Gotcha. That's the name of the company too. I couldn't remember cause I'm not a writer. Right. Um, Gotcha. Right. So, so those guys, those have guys are no more now the, uh, romance writers of America. That I, I have no, I, I think they're still around, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So I I was I was a guest of honor at their one of the guests of honor at their conference. Nice. Um, it was wonderful. It was a really it was wonderful to meet new people and to talk to new people, though. I thought of everyone at GRL. So all you GRL people. Hello. I did miss <laughs> you. I thought of you. Um, of, I'm going next year. I promise. <laughs> We uh we didn't know what to do when it's it's raining men came on at the dance on Saturday night. Everybody just cleared off the dance floor in your honor. It was amazing. <laughs> it was I'll tell you what, the uh the eighties prom night um was a hit this year, Andrew. This was like this was almost like old times GRL. I mean, people were dancing and a lot of them and very early on liquor was flowing. They had a bar that was readily accessible. Most everyone was dressed up. It was fantastic. It was it was really good, I got to admit. Well, I think that that I mean, last year we were still dealing with the end of COVID, so it was it was it was um it was just GRL was toned down. I think that just being able to go back and do some of the things that we used to do is oh. awesome. I'm so glad you got you. Everybody I've talked to said they had a great time and I'm just thrilled for them. I wish I could have been there. Yeah. And I told you off air and I'm going to say this on air. I mean, I think most I've, I've not been in Facebook to see, but everybody I talked to says most everybody at GRL got sick. And I'll tell you what, folks, that is a price I'm willing to pay. Cold sucks. Did they, I mean, me. did they get did, did they get COVID or just the con crud? Quite a few people are saying COVID. Um, and at this point, from my view and from what other people are saying as well, it's it's kind of like a cold. That's pretty much what it is. I probably have COVID myself right now. I have the same exact symptoms they do. I just haven't gone and gotten tested because I don't have an employer. So... What the fuck would I? Well, matter. you just 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 order the if you should have ordered the federal government tests for home. I just I'm not supporting any of that. <laughs> I just well, no. I mean, well, just, I mean it, they were it free. Doesn't matter. I well, somebody's paying for it though. It's but but I mean the the fact is it doesn't matter. I've got a cold. What are they going to do? Yeah. Um, and there's really nothing you can do to treat it. You, you, here's what I do. I, I I drink a bunch of tea with local honey in it, and then I put some Vicks on my chest and on the bottom of my feet and up my nose. Not in that order. And you wait it out. You get a lot of sleep. And, uh, well, but, uh, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I've just got a sore throat, and and it it could very well be from the fact that I end up talk ended up talking myself hoarse for three days. I I thought the exact same thing too. After after I got back, I I I, I kind of had a sore throat immediately after we got back, but it wasn't anything. And I was like, meh meh meh. But no, this turned into a full blown cold, which puts me out of business for a week or two at a time. Um, I did a, a session this morning for, it was for a, a, a documentary. It wasn't anything audiobook related. 
And uh, <clears throat> the lady actually said to me, oh, John, you've got your sexy voice today, um, <laughs> which you're going to hear in a minute Ooh. here. Um, yeah, John, it's... you need to have a per- – then, then the way that goes, John, you need to have a permanent cold so you can have your permanent sex. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. I can just start drinking NyQuil and doing those books. It'll be awesome. I'm not drunk. Yep. I've just been sick for two years. <laughs> I've just been sick for two years because I'm keeping up the sexy voice. Exactly. Boom, chick, <laughs> Um, well, so, uh, we're, we're going to, one other thing I wanted to tell you though, I was starting to tell you about GRL is I, I think there's some exciting news for us narrators on the horizon. Um, the Wednesday audiobook narration panel thing went really well this year. We had me, Greg Tremblay, uh, Michael Fulola, um, and Declan Winters. Um, and Declan's kind of a, a new cat, but he's done quite a bit of yep. work over the last couple of years. He's really good. And it was just a great group of guys. We had a lot of fun on stage. There was a fantastic crowd. It seems like everyone that was there early was there. Um, so we got to talking to one of the organizers afterwards, and it seems that the organizers have had gotten together already and decided they wanted to make Wednesday Narrator Day for GRL next year. So not only are we going to be doing the uh, panel uh, around 7 or 8 o'clock at night, um, which is kind of the the intro to GRL. Before that, we're going to be doing a couple different panels um, in some of the different rooms. We're going to split off and a couple of us do one, a couple of us do the other. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if it works out correctly, we might even have a room. Uh, They're talking about allowing us to have a room. So we can not only do like, it's going to be a small room, like 20, 30 seats. Um, Narrators can sign up uh, for time slots and do like story time events. So yeah. small, intimate, people can come in and, and hear us do readings. Mm-hmm. And um, I believe they're going to allow us to do Talk to the Beards um, and the time slots that are available otherwise, which means we can run Talk to the Beards in this small room, record it, and stream it live from GRL. Um, then occasionally I'll, I'll turn the room over to other narrators. They can come in and do story times. It's going to be fantastic. So that final yep. bit is getting worked out, but I think it's going to... I think it's going to happen, which is going to be cool. So um, you're definitely going to be there next year. Uh, we're going to lock that down right now. I'm, uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not planning staying, on it. I'm not staying in the same room with you. That's not going to happen. Just so we no, both know. No, no, Dominic has already said that I'm going with my con wife. <laughs> that is fantastic. Now, tell for people that have not been to a con with you, tell please tell them who your con wife is. Oh, Amy Lane is my con wife. She is. So, yep. I, uh... When when I, when when Amy and I went to Book Lovers in August, um, I was getting ready, and Dominic comes in the in the room where I'm packing everything, and and he's he he just says he turns to me and he says, "Are you going with? Are you going to be staying with your con wife?" And I said, "Yes." And he goes, "Okay," and then he just walks out of the room. <laughs> she uh. I was uh, there. They. Oh no! You... See, the thing is that Dominic always fusses and worries. Well, yeah. Okay. But he knows that if Amy's there with me, then she'll do the fussing and worrying and he doesn't have to. <laughs> well, she, I, I, I love Amy. She's just fantastic. But so yep. I'm, I forget what day it was. I think it might've been Friday. All the authors are upstairs and they're going off into their panel rooms and this and that and the other. And I see Amy Lane just looking confused in the middle of the hallway upstairs outside of the panel rooms. And I say, hi, Amy. And she said, do you know where my room is? <laughs> <laughs> and I, hang on a second, Amy. And I pulled up the guidebook and I, I directed her to her room. I got her in her room. I announced loudly as we were coming in, I found Amy Lane and I, I got her all the way up to the stage and I situated her and then I, I was able to leave. Yeah, she is, she's a one of a kind. There is no other Amy Lane. It, that is, Amy Lane is most definitely one of a kind. <laughs> Um, well, <clears throat> let's see what we got. What we got promoting today? Here. I'm going to pull up the uh, the graphic full screen so everybody can see. This is Fire and Glass. This is now. This is not. It is Carlisle cops? No, it's Carlisle deputies. Is that correct? This is Carlisle troopers. Troopers. I'm sorry. I book fourteen. What number is this? This is book Carlisle troopers book two. Oh, I see a little two on the bottom there. Look at that. Did you, did you get a different graphic artist? These graphics look a bit different than I'm used to. No. <laughs> no, it does. It has a different flavor. It looks good. It looks really good, but it has a different flavor. Um, well, what we did is, is is we've done the Carlisle Cops, and then we did the Carlisle Deputies, and these are the Carlisle Troopers, but each one has to look different, so the graphics are different. Nice. Uh, they did a great job on it. It just it has a different flavor to it, a different feel. Yes, LC sure Chase it. did a wonderful job. Yeah, is that like a, I don't know, a cartoonish kind of coloring over top of it all, so it, it, it damn near looks like a, a drawing as opposed to a picture. Yeah, she did a really great job. Yeah, that's really cool. 
Um, the dedication for this one. Oh, you finally dedicated one to Dominic. Look at that. Uh, for Dominic, who is always there for me no matter what. It's awful nice of you to finally do that, Andrew. Cheaper. Now, now um, I, from what you've told me, and as always, I've never read this before. Uh, from what you've told me, I'm going to read all the parts except for Casey. Is that correct? Yep, I'm going to read Casey. All right. Now, everybody, I've got my sexy voice on today, and if I stop to just start hacking, coughing, please, I apologize. At least I'll mute myself if I have to do it here. Chapter 1. State Trooper Casey Bambaro grumbled as he sat in his patrol car at the start of the workday, the summer sun beating in the windows, and read his messages. He already had two break-in reports to investigate, and he needed to get them looked into. Now he had a message to come into the office outside Carlisle to pick something up. At least one of the reported break-ins was between his current location in town, so it wouldn't be a wasted trip. He responded to the message and quickly scanned the others before buckling up. One of the things he loved about being a state trooper was that his car was his office. He didn't sit at a desk in some building pushing paper all day. He was out in the trenches, the primary law enforcement presence for a good part of his district, in case he liked it when the area under his patrol was quiet. It hadn't been for the past few months... Casey thought something had changed. The robberies were becoming more frequent, and those responsible were getting bolder. But he wasn't making progress getting to the source, which frustrated him to no end. After starting the engine, he pulled out of his driveway and used GPS to guide him to the address of the break-in. It was typical of what he'd been finding. The owners came home from a night out to find their home had been broken into. Easily sold electronics were gone, and so was the liquor. Medicine cabinets stripped of prescription meds, and any available jewelry cases or boxes were missing. Nothing else was touched, and no messes were made. In each case, the thieves seemed to know what they were looking for and got in and out, leaving very little trace of themselves. The fuckers knew what they were doing, and that ground at Casey. The jobs were small time enough, no big score up to this point, and yet the break-ins kept happening, sometimes three or four a week. <clears throat> He made notes about the incident, but unfortunately he could offer little hope of recovery. He added the report to his list of things to do and headed to the station. We got a big job for you, Collins, the sergeant in charge, said with an evil smile as he handed Casey a cup of coffee. Then he set a small battered beige fabric purse on his desk. This was found behind a business in Newville. It was turned over to the township and they passed it on to us to try to return. There was ID inside, so sometime today... Could you stop by the house and get it back to the owner? Casey grumbled. <clears throat> Is that why I had to come in? Collins narrowed his eyes. Don't be a growly pain in the ass. I even gave you coffee. I know it's inconvenient, but it's something we can do to help people. Remember? That's part of our job. We're supposed to be a team. He leaned forward and lowered his voice. You're a good trooper, and you take the job as seriously as a heart attack but your people's skills suck. None of the others want to work with you because every fucking thing is a competition. Well, knock it off. This isn't some sort of contest to see you can have the quietest patrol district. I will tell you, you could be up for an award. Asshole of the year. Whatever stick got lodged up your backside, you need to get rid of it. I do my job and I do it well. Casey knew that. He took pride in doing the best damn job he could. He lived for the job. Hell, it was almost all he had. Yeah, you're so good that other troopers stay away. Just take the arrogance down a notch and work on getting along with your fellow troopers. Because I sure as hell don't want to be writing you up for this. His gaze was rock hard, and Casey swallowed. You've been up for promotion, but it isn't going to happen until you are able to work with others. It's that simple. His expression softened a little. I know you want this, and you're a good trooper, but damn it, if others won't work with you, how can you lead them? The sergeant straightened up. Go on and get back out there. Casey took the coffee and left the office. He went back toward his car, making an effort to say good morning to others as he passed. What's with the purse? Trying out a new look? Wyatt Nelson asked. Casey's first instinct was to snark at him, but he swallowed it. Just some lost property to return. Wyatt paused in his steps. Of course, that most definitely isn't your color, and it doesn't go with your shoes at all. He smiled and rolled his eyes. Come on, Casey, I was only kidding. What's gotten under your skin? It's nothing, Casey said gently. 
Just more work than I have hours. You know how it is. Their districts were next to each other and sometimes overlapped. Yeah, I do. If you need backup, let me know. I can... He stopped himself. His first instinct was to say he could handle things in his district just fine, as though Wyatt had been taking a dig at him. But Wyatt's open expression gave him pause. Thanks. I appreciate the offer. You do the same. He lifted the bag in his hand. Okay. I need to return my fashion accessory to the right to its rightful owner. A smile crossed his lips. I'll see you later. Wyatt half jogged into the building and Casey got into his patrol car. He had another break in to investigate and the purse to return, and that was before any more reports came in. And given the way things had been going lately, more reports were inevitable. He just wished he could get a handle on these break ins. Casey knew they were related, but there was very little to go on. His first stop was another robbery investigation. The story was much the same. The usual types of items had been stolen. So far, he had nine incidents in the past four weeks. Casey took down the details and made notes of the similarities to the others, then left behind yet another shaken and frightened homeowner who wanted answers like Casey did. Back in his patrol car, he took a few minutes to review his notes before heading to the address on the identification in the purse. Ten minutes later, he pulled onto the gravel two-track that led up to the house. He slowly got out of the car, taking in his surroundings. There were no cars and no human sounds. Casey wasn't sure if anyone was home until the curtains on the nearest window moved to the side and then slid back into place. His boots crunched on the gravel and birds sang in the nearby trees while cicadas hummed their mating song. He went up to the front door and knocked firmly, carrying the purse under his arm. When he didn't get an answer, he knocked again, knowing people were inside. Soft footsteps behind the door told him someone was indeed home. He was about to knock a third time, when he heard locks disengaging, and then the door cracked open a couple of inches. A kid peered through the crack. Is your mother home? Casey asked. He didn't get an answer. I'm with the police and I have her purse. Can you get her, please? He noticed the chain was still on the door. It closed, and then after some fumbling and clinking, the door opened again. Mommy isn't home, a little boy about ten years old said. Is your dad here? When the boy shrugged, he became concerned. Who's home with you? Mama will be back, the boy said, his voice high and pitched with fear and worry. It's okay, I have her purse. Is it okay if I bring it inside? I'm a policeman. He knelt down. You know that the police are here to help you, right? He had taught stranger danger classes and knew he needed to be careful. He didn't want to scare the kid, but he wondered what was really going on. While he waited, one more little face peered out from behind the boy. A small girl, Cassie, <laughs> a small girl Casey guessed might be five or six, holding a stuffed rabbit. Mama says not to talk to strangers, that I'm not supposed to let anyone in the house. The young boy was scared, that was obvious, but there was something more to it. Let me bring in your mama's purse. I'm not going to hurt you. God, he hoped he sounded as kind and gentle as he was trying to. Are you two home alone? The boy shook his head. Bo is here, too, the boy said. Casey breathed a little uh, easier. How old is he? He hoped that was the babysitter. Four, the boy answered. It dawned on Casey that there were three young kids without an adult. How long has your mommy been gone? The little girl, the little girl, yeah. The little girl began to cry. I want mommy, she whimpered, and the boy lowered his head. Casey didn't make any move to go inside. When did you see your mama last? The boy shrugged. Was it today? Casey half whispered in an effort to be gentle. The boy shook his head. Yesterday? Another head shake. It's okay. I'm going to help you, I promise. Fuck, he had seen a hell of a lot of shit that people did to one another. A killing that gave him nightmares for weeks. Men hitting their wives and girlfriends. Those calls got to him every time. He'd seen the worst kind of hurt. But these three kids, and he hoped there weren't more, touched his heart. After six years on the job, Casey had come to wonder if that was even possible any longer. It was easier to wall it off than to let it get battered day in and day out. What's your name? Casey asked, deciding to take things really slow. I'm Trooper Casey. 
Philip, the boy answered softly. Casey leaned a little closer. And what's your name? He asked the little girl. That's Jolie, Philip answered as Jolie slunk behind him. He wasn't going to push inside. Have you had enough to eat? I'm hungry, Jolie whispered and started crying again. It's okay. Do you want my help to get something to eat? Casey asked. He held out his hand. Philip stared at it and then took it. Relief washed over Casey as he slowly got up and followed Philip into the house. It was pretty clean. The house seemed to have been vacuumed and dusted recently. He did a quick sweep of the house, including checking the upstairs before returning. What have you been eating? Casey went through the living room and dining areas to the kitchen. A pile of dishes, mostly plates and cups, sat in the sink. Peanut butter and jelly? Jolie answered as Casey opened the refrigerator. It held very little. Some condiments, a nearly empty jar of jam, a quarter of a jar of peanut butter, some pickles, and a mostly empty jug of milk. The cupboards didn't have much more, with a few boxes of macaroni and cheese and some spices. He didn't see any bread or even crackers. God, these kids were down to the very end of their food. Where's Bo? Casey asked Philip. Hiding, Philip answered. Why don't you both go find him and I'll make some macaroni and cheese, okay? There were so many things running through his head, but he didn't want to panic the kids. They were already under enough stress. Once they hurried away, he called in and requested Wyatt's backup, got some water on the stove to get the kids fed, and then made a call to child services. The kids returned with their brother in tow. Little Bo was adorable, with the head of unruly brown hair, huge brown eyes, and his thumbs stuck firmly in his mouth. <clears throat> Are you Bo? Casey asked gently, and Bo nodded, leaving his thumb firmly in place. Do you like macaroni and cheese? He nodded again, holding Philip's hand. Good. Jolie said she was hungry and I wanted to make you something to eat. No peanut butter? Jolie asked, and when Casey shook his head, she grinned. Good. Once he got the boxed mac and cheese finished, Philip got out what seemed to be the last of the clean dishes in the cupboard and the last clean silverware in the drawer. Once again, Casey wondered how long these poor children had been in the house alone. After he got the food dished up and Philip divided the last of the milk between them, Casey stepped out of the room to call the sergeant. What's going on? The sergeant asked. <clears throat> that purse you gave me to return opened a whole kettle of fish. I got here and the lady it belongs to is nowhere to be found. Her three children are in the house alone, probably have been for days. He felt sick at the thought. What kind of parent did this sort of thing? I needed you to know that this is going to take a while. I don't think they've eaten much, so I made them something to eat. Why it is going to be over soon, and I called child services. Good. Keep the kids calm and find out what you can from them. Maybe we can find a relative in the area who will take them. Call in names, and I'll have people here get on it. Okay. Casey agreed, still a little nervous about providing unexpected child care. All three of them are eating like they haven't had a hot meal in days. Any idea how long they've been alone? Guessing five days to a week. The poor things have eaten what they can and are nearly out of food. He spoke softly, looking out the window as Wyatt pulled up in his patrol car, followed by a dark sedan that Casey hoped was child services. I'll send you, I'll send you any information I can get. They ended the call, and Casey led Wyatt and Donald Ickle, the social worker from child services who'd driven the sedan, inside. Then he returned to the kitchen to find Philip and Jolie at the table, but Bo missing. Where is he? Hiding, Jolie said. Strange men scare him. There were people in the garage a few days ago, and it scared him really bad. Will you check that out? Casey asked Wyatt, who nodded. Casey found Bo hiding in one of the cupboards. He bent down, talking softly and holding out his hand. Once Bo took it, he lifted the little boy, hugging him, surprised when Bo put his arms around his neck and held almost tightly enough to cut off his air. Are you still hungry? Casey asked, rubbing his back. What, Mama? He cried. I know, and I'm going to try to find her for you. What the hell else was he supposed to say? I promise. Do you want to eat some more? Sit with me, Philip said. Bo went to his brother and sat on his lap. Casey pushed the plate over to him and swallowed hard. Then he tilted his head toward the other room, 
and Donald followed him. Uh, which one's Donald? <laughs> Say, oh, Donald is the social services worker. Yeah. Got it. <clears throat> what have we got here? Donald asked with Mom a missing. Sigh. Oh, Mom missing for nearly a week, I guess. Father not around. I made them something to eat because they looked half starved and there was little food in the house. Um, he cleared his throat. It's okay. If these sorts of things don't get to you, then you aren't human. And believe me, I've seen worse. At least these three are fed and relatively clean, and they seem to trust you to a degree. Introduce me as Donnie and tell them that I'm going to help them find their mother, too. I'm hoping we can locate a relative that will take them. Sorry? Just getting my sexy voice sexier. No. Oh. <laughs> Casey said, and Donald nodded. They returned to the kitchen and introduced Donald. Philip, uh, can you tell me your last name? He wanted to make sure that the kids had the same surname as their mother. Riley, he answered. Casey wrote it down, being thorough. Then it gave him a few seconds to process his horror at these kids being left alone. Do you have an aunt and uncle that you see? Casey hoped Philip would know the most information, but he shook his head. Is there anyone you know? A cousin? Maybe a close friend of your mom's? The kids all looked at one another blankly. What about your grandma and grandpa? Another shake of the head. Do you have any relatives close by? He was becoming a little desperate. Well, there's Uncle Bertie, but Mama says he doesn't like us. Mama had a fight with him, so we don't see him anymore. Mama says he's mean and doesn't care, Jolie supplied. Is your Uncle Bertie's last name Riley, too? He asked, and Philip shrugged. Casey wrote it down anyway and hoped for the best. He messaged the sergeant with the information along with the kids' names and ages. Maybe there were records that would help? Anything so these kids could be properly taken care of. You did really good, Donald told Philip, who finished up his food and put his dishes <laughs> in the nearly overflowing sink. I need to do that myself. Hang on. <laughs> One more time. Feel free to have a drink amongst yourselves. He then helped the littler ones before they wandered into the living room, sat on the sofa, and turned on the television. What the? Casey asked Donald. They're fed and calm, and that's the best thing for now. Let's hope that we can find a relative who will take them. But if not, I'll make some calls. Casey shared the information he had gotten from the kids with Donald, who would have his own report to write. Wyatt came inside, his expression grim. Someone was in the garage, and it's my guess that they took whatever had any value at all. The place was pretty well cleaned out, but I have no idea what they might have gotten without the owner to tell us. I doubt the kids would know, but there is definite evidence of a break-in. Any sign of who might have done it? Other than things missing? Wyatt shook his head. I don't know. It's like stuff isn't there any longer, but that's about all. It looked like the side door was open and they got in easily. But they made noise and scared the kids, Casey said. Who would who, <clears throat> who may have seen somebody? I'm pretty sure little Bo hid, but the others might have looked outside. I'll ask them, Wyatt offered, but Casey put his hand on his arm, stopping him. No, he said gently. Casey's right. It should be him, Donald said and went into the living room. Casey paused and decided that he didn't need to ask those questions at the moment. Bo sat on Philip's lap, the older boy's arms cradling his brother. Jolie sat next to both of them, hugging the stuffed rabbit, leaning on Philip, all three of them comforting each other. The last thing he wanted to do was add more stress with his questions. His phone vibrated, and he left the kids with Donald and Wyatt and took the call in the kitchen. Hey, Sarge. We located a relative, the uncle. His name is Bertram Riley, and he lives on East South Street in Carlisle. I'll text you the address and phone number. I suggest contacting him. See what he's willing to do. I will, thank you. Casey said, and then punched in the numbers from the text. He would prefer to do this in person, but showing up at the guy's front door might be more of a shock. Mr. Riley? He asked once the call was answered. Yes? I'm Trooper Casey Mambaro with the State Police. Do you know Philip, Bo, and Jolie? He asked, hoping to trigger something. 
Yes. They're my sister's children. Has something happened to them? Has Jin done something? The second question was asked as though he expected a positive answer. Then the tone changed. Case, what happened? That nickname and the voice triggered an old, strong memory. Something, someone, he hadn't thought about in years. Bertie? He asked softly. He probably should have put the pieces together before this, but the thought had never occurred to him. Just like that, memories flooded back. The two of them in class, the way Bertie couldn't seem to take his gaze off him, the lunches they had together with their group of friends. Casey pulled his attention out of the past and put it back where it belonged. The kids are okay, he said. But we can't locate her, and it looks like she could have been gone for as long as a week. A sharp gasp reached through the phone, followed by near panic. I'll be right there. Now it was Casey's turn to feel as though the ground had shifted under his feet as his heart beat a little faster at the knowledge that he was going to see the first guy he'd fallen in love with. Casey chided himself to get his head in the game and out of this flight of fancy, but still, he couldn't stop the jolt of excitement that lingered for longer than it should. About three quarters of the way through there, I was like, uh-oh, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. <laughs> as, as always, though, <laughs> You are a freaking pro, Andrew. Uh, another fabulous intro to a story. Um, I'm assuming this is out today. Is that correct? It's out today, yes. Fire and glass. And is it on KU, Kindle Unlimited? No, it, this one is not Kindle Unlimited. It is It is on Kindle, but it's not in KU. Gotcha. Well, um, it's wonderful to have you on again, man. I missed you. Um, hopefully, Dominique is taking good care of you over there and feeding you well and all that he good is. stuff. He is. He just got home. Excellent. Well, go enjoy your husband. Thanks, everyone, for hanging around. Um, we will be back here as soon as my voice is up to task back in Discord to be working again. And sorry about the talk to the beard on Monday. Apparently, uh, I'm not good at looking at a schedule to see that we were supposed to start two hours early. So my bad there. We'll be back again <laughs> on Monday. So, yeah. Anyways, love you all. Have fun. Andrew, wave bye to the camera, buddy. Bye to the camera.